one, learning from problems. Hmm? Problems come into our lives in many forms and through many means. We talked about that. Sometimes it's people, sometimes it's the devil, sometimes it's God, and sometimes it's us, most of the time anyway. One thing is certain, if God allows trouble into the life of a believer, he's trying to teach us something, to tell us something about ourselves. If we cause the problem, he's telling us, don't do it again. Amen? Our text is found in the book of Romans, in the 13th chapter. As you find it in your Bible, would you stand with me as we honor God's word? Romans 13, beginning at verse 11. How many know we're living in a very wicked, evil world? I was listening the other night to the news about an incident that happened in a place in New Jersey where a woman killed her two-year-old child. Anybody hear it? What a sad case. What a sad case. And decapitated the little, little, I think it was a little boy, put his head in the refrigerator. I mean, oh my God, I've seen some terrible things as a policeman. I can imagine the people that saw this. This is what we are up against today. We've left God out of everything in America, and the devil has moved into every place. We need to evict him. Amen? Amen. He doesn't belong in these places. And God has placed you in, in a community to find people like this that are troubled, that are on the edge, that are on the verge, because a word from God can turn them around. Listen to the Holy Spirit for these divine appointments. Romans 13, beginning at verse 11. And knowing that the time, that now is nigh time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting or drunkenness and chambering and fighting and wantonness, not in strife and fighting and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. The Lord bless the reading of his word and bless his servant as he brings it forth. You may be seated. <clears throat> Many times in this life, in the natural as well as in the spiritual, we need to take a course correction. How many know what I'm talking about? Just like a ship or a plane, you may be going in a particular direction, but just be off one or two degrees, and before you know it, you're way off. And sometimes our life is like this, just a little bit off course, but taking us into problems and dangerous situations. God sometimes sends problems our way to help us to get back on course, to make the corrections that we need. The Bible shows us that Christ wants us to make at least four changes, major corrections in our lives when we come to him. You know, a lot of times we think and we tell people, you come and get saved, everything will be fine. It's not automatic. A lot of it has to do with us. Yes, the Lord saves us and forgives us, but the rest, a lot of times, is up to us. The Bible says old things are passed away. They don't automatically die. Have you know that? You got to let them die. Those old habits and old things that, that messed us up. Behold, all things become new. How many know that salvation is a process? We have to work at it every day. Hmm? Wednesday night, if you came to Bible study, we were talking about it's impossible in this world to not sin. It's all around us. It's drawing us. It's, it's trying to get us to go a different way. Wherever you go, TV, computer, walking down the street, wherever you are at work, Sin is coming right in our face. Let's take a look at some of these changes so that we can lead a life of victory. Isn't that what we want? A light of life of righteousness in Jesus Christ. Why do we have to change? Because the things that we're doing may be more harmful than beneficial for us. And sometimes we can't see it, or sometimes we want to do it, even though we know it's wrong. I'll say amen for you. First know that Christ corrects us and even causes problems in our life because he loves us. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? But you know what? If you're a parent, you know what this means. Look what it says in Proverbs 3.12. Whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father or son or a daughter in whom he delights. We wouldn't be who we were if our parents didn't correct us and change our direction. 
A good parent guides a child's behavior constantly and continually, teaching them, disciplining them what is good and acceptable behavior and what is bad and unacceptable. A lot of children today have no idea what's good or bad. They do whatever they want, whenever they want. And their parents, for some reason, go along with it. I have to walk out of stores sometimes listening to a child cursing, kicking, hitting their parent. I didn't grow up that way. I don't know about you. I came through the, the spoon, the wooden spoon, the shoe, the belt, all those wonderful things. But it works if it's done in love. Amen? Not politically correct today, right? And look what we messed up. Look what we have. You see, without correction and discipline, a child, even an adult, grows up to be wild and reckless and making himself miserable, herself miserable, and messing up everybody around them. We need direction. We need discipline. God wants us to be mature in the natural as well as in the spiritual. It means God wants us to grow up. Hmm? Grow up. How many people are 30, 40 years old and they still haven't grown up? Maybe, phys maybe physically and, and, and by age, but not from behavior. If you want to have inner peace, if you want to have inner joy, if you want to enjoy relationships with other people and with God and, and get the blessings that God wants for you, for you to have, you need to grow up into the things of God that will help us to be that way. Let's start with some of these. How about this one? Pride. We don't have pride, do we? How much money do we spend on things to make us look good? Hmm? I was reading the paper yesterday. It was interesting. A man passed away. He was over here in Rescue 5. Again, a victim of 9-11 cancer. And they had a story about him where a lady had jumped in front of a train, one of the train stations here, and got a little bit messed up. But she was alive. And when this fireman got to her, she said, how do I look? And he said, I don't know what you look like before you jumped in front of the train. <laughs> but we're so concerned about ourselves. We want to be the person, right? Pride. Look at Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Now, what are these things? When you read the Bible, get a dictionary. Look up some of these words because the words in and of themselves are self-defined. Pride always ends up in destruction. When life ends, or even before it, the things we're so proud of, the things we've achieved, the things we've earned, the things we've, we, we've, we've won, the things we've accomplished, the things we own, all fade away. The older you get, the less important things become, as far as things are concerned. Amen? I'll say it for you, senior saints. Having pride is having too high an opinion about ourselves. Wow. You know, sometimes Christians can have a, a pride too. Like we're better than anybody else. Listen, we're only saying the sinner is saved by grace. Shock, right? We have too high of an opinion of ourselves in relation to God. And we take credit for things that belong to God. If God does something, don't take the credit. Hmm? I know Christians say, well, if I don't pray for them, they ain't going to get healed. What is that? That's pride. That's pride. Mm. How about a haughty spirit? You ever see this in church? Having too high an opinion of ourselves in relation to other people. And taking credit for what rightfully belongs to other people. I've worked on a lot of jobs. You ever worked on a job where you gave an idea to your boss, and the next thing you know, was his idea or her idea? Huh? Ever happened to you? Mm-mm-mm. That's a haughty spirit, taking credit for what's not yours. Both attitudes bring about problems in life automatically. We see from Scripture that God hates pride. Now, there are things we can be prideful of. We can be prideful of accomplishments. But remember who got you there. Because in Christ, we're on a different, we're on a different road. God opens doors. God gives us wisdom. God wakes up a, a, a brain that was dead on alcohol and drugs. Dead cells become alive again. Oh, hallelujah. We can be proud of our accomplishments, but, but realize how we got there. Amen? We see from Scripture, like I said, 
God hates pride. And we see the effect it has on people. Lucifer, this beautiful angel, the music minister of heaven, beautiful, more beautiful than anyone else, is thrown out of heaven because of pride. I will be like God, he said. Well, he found out that wasn't true. Even Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. That was the thing that Satan got to even Adam about. Eat this fruit and you shall be as gods. And they did it. And look what happened. Hmm? If, you mean, if you've heard the Thanksgiving speech that Abraham Lincoln made back in 1863, talking to America, he should say it today if he was alive. He said, who do you think you are? That's what he basically said. Do you think you built this country? Do you think you made this country great? He said, no, it was God that did it. And you need to thank him, not yourselves. Same thing today. We need that. This country needs to realize it's not a great country because of great leaders. It's because of God. Hallelujah. Pride is listed in Proverbs 6. Among nine things, seven things that God calls an abomination. Abomination is greatly disliked, vile. Listen to them. And if you look at them, they're related to body parts. A proud look. You know what that is? I'm not like him. Jesus has a little story about that, right? Proud look. A lying tongue. Politically, that's not the word anymore. What is it? I misspoke. Right? Hands that shed innocent blood. Hmm? Some of our doctors need to read this. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that are swift to run to evil. Wow, we can't wait to get there. Hmm? A false witness who speaks lies from the mouth. How about this one? One who sows discord among the brethren. Oh, boy. What's discord? Disagreement. Lack of harmony. There are people in church that don't like people to be together. Isn't that sad? They haven't been touched yet by the Holy Ghost. That's what they need. God hates pride because it keeps us from allowing God to use us for his purposes and glory. I've met Christians that think they're God. They think that God has to come to them for advice. Or God asks them, what do you think? In all my years as a Christian, God's never asked me what I think. He just tells me what to do. And I've learned that in 28 years of police work that that's the way it is. Yes, sir. No, sir. He doesn't ask our opinion. He knows best. You see, pride makes us useless in the kingdom of God. And even in life itself. If you work with, around a person or you're around a person that is always prideful, it's very difficult to, to be with them. We always have to remember that God does not exist for us. We exist for him, to serve him. Amen? God will not share his glory with anyone. He says that I'm a jealous God. There are no others. Oh, my goodness. Oh, you don't have an idol in your house, just in your garage, in your basement, right? In America, our idols are prettier than other countries. Our pride can be the cause of our problems. You know that? God may even allow problems in our life to humble us before him and, and others. We talked about Paul's thorn in the flesh. What was it all about? It was about Paul. I know you've been a success, Paul. I know you're, you're in all the newspapers, Paul. I know you're on TV, Paul. I know you're this and I know you're that. But you're nothing without me. And I'm going to remind you every day. Jacob had a lot of pride, too, including deception pride. And what happened? He limped the rest of his life. Every time he took a step, he remembered who God was and who God is. You see, prideful people always think in the I, me, and we. Never in us. They don't want to submit to God's will. We may need to correct this attitude. It may not be strong, but it's there. How about this? Not harboring evil. We live in a country where good is bad and bad is good. Do you realize we're the troublemakers, the believers? We're the troublemakers. 
We don't go along with what everybody wants to do. We say, God says this. Oh, no, no, no. We took a vote. And the vote says 98% of the people want to do this, so it's good. When a law doesn't apply, they just move it over. They move the boundary over. We're still good. God never moves the boundary. And we're the boundary keepers. We remind people, even without saying anything, that you just move the boundary. It doesn't work. You can pass all the laws you want. And the courts can rule them. But God never changes. You can't change his laws. You see, in this world, we're either evil or we're righteous. There's no in-between. It all depends on how we respond to Jesus Christ. He's the one that makes us righteous. No, not one of us is without sin, right? If we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior of our lives, then we change. We must change. We have to move from the sinner to the saint part. It takes a lifetime. Amen? We need to recognize our, our sinfulness and that we need to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ every day. We need to be forgiven and cleaned up and become a new creation. That's the progress, the process. In Deuteronomy 19 and 19, it gives us a picture of Moses exhorting the people. They kept messing up. They kept messing up. And he tells them, so shalt thou put away evil from among you. And then he warns them about what was going to happen, but they didn't listen. Jesus told a woman taken in adultery. We talked about that this week. She was guilty. Everybody was there to accuse her. Jesus turned it around. The law said she should be put to death. He wrote the sins of the accusers on the ground, and they all melted away. But look what he said to the woman. Go and sin no more. Maybe she thought it was a lucky day. She got away with it. Jesus warned her, don't do it again. Hmm? By the way, where was the man? Takes two, doesn't it? <laughs> what was Jesus saying to her? He was saying, lady, change your ways. Change your ways. The Holy Spirit through the scripture teaches us that God wants us to hate sin, but not the sinner. Hmm? To hate the consequences of sin. Do you know sin has consequences? Even for the believer, there's consequences to sin. Sickness, prison, all kinds of things, death. We're to turn away from evil at every opportunity. God wants us to flee from evil. If you have to run, run. Get away from it. Hmm? To protect us from its consequences. Sin always has a negative consequence never a good one sin always bears bad fruit bad fruit always the only antidote to sin is the righteousness of god the cross the blood of jesus christ listen to what it says in first john 1 7 and 9 the blood of jesus christ cleanses us from all sin i've had a lot of blood on me for different times different people and you know something it doesn't cleanse the blood of people but the blood of Jesus cleanses us. It doesn't leave a stain. Hallelujah. It takes away the stains. Hallelujah. Here's, I like this one. This comes right after it. I, I met a sister one day that said this to me. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. When I gave her the scripture, she didn't like me after that. But I had to do that. My job is to tell you what the Bible says, if you forgot. If we confess our sins... He, the Lord Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And listen to this part. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What's that mean? It means he takes away the desire to sin. He takes away the thought to sin. Why do we sin then? Why do we keep doing it? Because we override, we delete, we push the button, and we go back. It's not God's fault. He not only forgave us, he said, I'm taking away the desire to do that. But we say, oh, I got away with it. Paul answers that in Romans. He said, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid, he says. Hallelujah. Again, we may need to change our outlook on sin. Sin is not forgiveness, go back and do it again. Forgiveness, go back and do it again. Back and forth. That's not it. Because the consequences of sin catch up to you. 
Yeah, you may be forgiven, but you may have an little STD, and that's not a, a, a ship ride somewhere, or some, a few other things that go along with it. How about this one? Correcting our associations. Hmm. Even the world figured this out, by the way. People, places, and things. We need fellowship. We were created for fellowship as, as human beings. We need other people. They need us. No man is an island, as the poet said many years ago. Problems many times teach us that maybe we need to change those we associate with. Oh, I'm, I'm there to witness to them. Oh, yeah. So you go drinking with them, you go partying with them, you go do this with them, you do your drugs with them, you're witnessing to them, all right, but for the wrong side. Hmm? You know, there's an old saying, when you want to know who a person is, look at their friends. Hmm? Who were they friends with? Listen to Psalm 1.1. This is powerful. It says, Blessed is the man or woman that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. This is a downward progression. You walk with people in sin, you hang out with them, you stand with them, and then you sit down with them. There's something wrong with that picture if you're a believer. Hmm? I'm not saying you, you, you're going to make fun of them, that you have nothing to do with them, but you can't participate in what they're doing. Hmm? If you do, you've destroyed your testimony, and you're not going to win them to Christ because you're no better than them. In fact, they think you're a hypocrite. Even the world has respect for someone who says what he said and does what he says. We need fellowship, but our fellowship needs to be rooted in love, in God's love, in exhortation. We need people to correct us. Do you know that? How many people never need correction here? Anybody? If you raise your hand, I'll tell you you do. We all need to be corrected. We make mistakes. We make wrong turns, right? But that should be rooted in love. We need people to encourage us. Paul would have never been the apostle he was without a Barnabas to encourage him. Right from the very beginning of his ministry, the church wanted nothing to do with him. He had a bad reputation, a murderer of the saints, a tormentor. But one man said, God has his hand on this man and I'm going to work with him. And he encouraged Paul. We need encouragers. We need fellowship with those who desire to help us to walk in God's ways. Who are you hanging out with? Hmm? Wicked and evil people will attempt to lure us, to turn us back to our old ways, if not worse. Hmm? Real friendship is exemplified in the love of Christ. Read what Christian love is all about in 1 Corinthians 13. A patient, kind, humble, polite, selfless, unruffled, positive without compromise, rooted in truth, supportive, hoping, enduring, all of these things we should look for in our friendships. We're brothers and sisters in Christ, right? What does that mean? It means we must be friends. We must help each other, pray for each other, be there for each other, encourage each other. That's what it's all about. Listen, you're going to spend eternity with people. You might as well get to know them here. Hmm? Godly relationships bring blessings into our lives here on earth. Bad relationships bring disaster. And I know you've had some. Hmm? What are the three worst words, the most dangerous words in the world? I love you. Boy, have we been fooled by those three words. But when someone loves us in a godly way, it's a lot different, isn't it? When you have people in your life that are tormenting you, that are luring you away from the things of God, get away from them. Hmm? Well, how are they going to get saved? Pray for somebody else to go and witness to them because God will send someone else. Hallelujah. We need people who are going to walk with us and encourage us to stay on the right path, to help us to grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. Godly friends will be with you through trouble and through anything that happens. Such a friend, the Bible says, sticketh closer than a brother. A friend that loves us at all times, and a brother is born in adversity. Notice that. 
a real brother is there for us when we're in trouble. Hmm? And we have a problem. A true friend will always be there when you need them. That's why Jesus, through Paul, tells us in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you, never forsake you. If you are looking for a friend, that's your template. That's your example of what a friend should be. Years ago, when we were talking about friends one time in our youth group, one of the young men said, you know, as I got older, I had less friends and more acquaintances. Hmm? Lastly, how about priorities? What is your priority list in life? Hmm? Not your bucket list, your priority list. What's the most important thing in your life? Hmm? You see, problems are going to come. Sickness, loss, death. They're going to remind us of what's really important to us. When people get sick, that's when they find out what's important and who is really their friends. In a marriage, that becomes very real when a person is sick and the, and the other partner is there for them. Our priority should go something like this. Our relationship with God should be first because hmm? it affects everything else. Our relationship with our family, our relationship with friends, our health, our peace of mind, our hope of heaven, all of these things are important. But God is first. Look in the Bible, there's some interesting characters that forgot this. We read in, in the book of Second Chronicles about a young man. He's 16 years old when he becomes the king of Judah. Wow, 16. And under the tutoring of the prophet Zechariah, it says, Uzziah sought God. That means he pursued him. He searched for him. He looked for God in everything. And in 2 Chronicles 26, we read his biography. It says, as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. Wow. Do you seek the Lord when you have a problem or maybe a problem hasn't arrived yet, but you anticipate? Do you ask him? No, you call the pastor, you call everybody else, right? We should be the last people you call. God should be first. You're calling me? I don't know everything. I'm not all over at the same time, and I'm not all powerful, but he is. He's the guy to ask. What should I do? The Holy Spirit that leads and guides us. Holy Spirit, lead me and guide me. Teach me. Show me. And he will. Hallelujah. As long as he sought the Lord... God made him prosper. Maybe the reason you're not prospering in every aspect of your life is you don't put God first. I've seen men and women in this church as I've grown up prosper. You know why they prospered? Because God was first. If they had a business, they went into business with God. Hmm? God makes us prosper. Not ourselves. The people in the world prosper, but they don't, it doesn't last. And it has no value at all. Because when God makes you prosper, you bless other people. Hallelujah. Uzziah was able to accomplish great things during his reign as king, as long as he sought the Lord. He defeated many enemies that came against him. He's only 16 years old. He built forts and towers. He dug many successful wells. They needed water supply. He built strong, a strong army to defend the kingdom. His fame and his, his, his success spread far and wide. But, but, at some point in his life, he no longer sought the Lord. You know, sometimes people think they don't need God anymore. They're on top of the heap. Hmm? Even in ministry. He no longer sought the Lord. When he was strong, the Bible says, when he was successful, his heart was lifted up. Look at what I have done. Hmm? In the history of Rome, there's a very interesting aspect of it. The Caesars were so powerful that they thought they were God. And the people worshipped them. Literally worshipped them. And the Senate in Rome knew that this was a trap. So they would hire a soldier, usually, to stand behind or on the side.